Today I want to start off with reading a verse, a couple of verses from the book of Exodus. And it's about Moses. He's up on the Mount Sinai. He's with God. And he asks us, he asks us please, you'll see in 33, 18, please show me your glory. And then God says, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. So Moses asked to see God's glory. God says, I'm going to show you my goodness. Well, that's what I hope to do today uh, is show you some of God's goodness that he has shown me in the Old Testament. So, Lord, I just pray that you would help me with this presentation, Lord, that it would minister life, that you would be with my mouth and just help me to make sense of what you showed me so uh, someone else can see your goodness too, Lord. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So today I want to talk about a group of people who were Gibeonites, who were ultimately, they were uh, Canaanites. And we'll get into who the Canaanites were in a little bit. But So let me lay the groundwork for this story. Moses had led the children of Israel out of Egypt, out from underneath the Pharaoh's thumb. Uh, they've crossed the Red Sea. They're in the wilderness. They spent 40 years in the wilderness because of unbelief in God uh, going to claim the land. And Joshua and Caleb, the only two of that generation that survived to go into the promised land. So we're at the point now where Joshua is going to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. And I've got a map here to show you the promised land. This is the promised land. The red boundaries are today's borders. You'll see the area of the promised land was known as Canaan back when Joshua was coming in. And it was the land that God had promised Abraham that he would give to Abraham and his descendants uh, through Isaac. And then again through Jacob as he narrowed it down, which descendants he was talking about, which were the Isra Israelites, the Jews. God said that. He was going to give them the promised land as part of the covenant he made with Abraham. So today, uh, the promised land consists of the land of Israel. The promised land of the promise, I should say, consists today of the land of Israel, uh, Gaza, parts of Lebanon, parts of Syria, parts of Jordan, and a stretch of land that goes all the way to Euphrates River in Iraq. And it was all promised, all this was promised to Abraham and fulfilled temporarily, or short, I'd say, temp yeah, temporarily, during King David and his son King Solomon's reign. Uh, it's very short-lived, but it's not the full promise that they have not received the full promise as of yet. That will come when Jesus Christ comes back on the earth. So who are the Canaanites? Let's get back to the Bible here. And there are going to be some portions of Scripture that are fairly long, but I feel like I need, I'm need. i going to need to read the entirety of it so you can get the story down. I'm not going to assume anybody knows any of this. I'm going to, uh, so I'm going to explain it as if you've never read about the story, have not heard the story. And if you do know it, well, God bless you. Uh, hang in there. I will get to the point, but there's going to be a, a significant amount of Scripture is going to be read in this presentation. So the Canaanites were inhabitants of the promised land before uh, the Israelites took it over. And they were made up of, like I said, of, of people groups that were descendants of Canaan, the son of Ham, the son of Noah. Noah was Canaan's grandfather. So they, ultimately, Noah is their ancestor, their great-great-grandfather. Uh, some of the more recognizable groups of the Canaanites are the Amorites, the Jebusites, the Hivites, the Sidonians, uh, the Hittites, and the Gibeonites. And most of this, these groups, as you read the Old Testament, you will know they were in one or more wars with Israel. So let's talk, so let's talk about the Canaan people. The Canaanites, they were ultimately marked for destruction. God said in Deuteronomy, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. And this is what he says. He's, uh, Moses is talking to the children of Israel, bringing the word of the Lord to them. And he says, When the Lord your God brings you into the land which you shall go possess, and has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Pezrites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, 
seven nations greater and mightier than you. And notice that Canaanites are a separate people on the one hand. And on the other hand, all these are descendants of Canaan. These Hittites, Gergshites, Hamrites, all descendants of Canaan. So they are also in the big umbrella of the Canaanites. So just keep that in mind. Don't let that confuse you. But these are seven nations that are mightier than Israel that God's going to drive out. And when the Lord your God delivers them over to you, you shall conquer them. And this is where I said they're marked for destruction and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, nor shall you show mercy to them. Uh, nor shall you take marriages with them. In other words, they're not to intermarry. And you shall not give your daughters your son, nor you nor take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. And the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you. So the Canaanites initially are marked for destruction by God. And there's a reason for this. And I'll get to that in a little bit. But I, the, the, the thing I want to point out here is he's is, uh, in all right, right here. You shall make no covenant with them, nor show mercy to them. I want to zero focus. I want to zero and make no covenant with them. And and God says, I've down here, you know, he said later that it's because they're going to turn your hearts away from me if you do. So Deuteronomy 9, 4, God tells why he's driving out these Canaanites. God's telling Israel says, look, don't think in your heart. After the Lord your God has cast them out before you because of my righteousness, the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. God says, don't think it's because of your righteousness, Israel, that he's going to destroy these nations before you. But it is because of the wickedness of these nations and driving them out. And as you will read, as you read the Old Testament, you will learn that their wickedness is pretty heinous. It's uh, not only were they sacrificing the demons, and things, but they were offering their children up as burnt offerings to their God Baal or Baal. I'm not sure the exact proper way to spell, uh, pronounce it. B A A L. I've heard it pronounced Baal, and I've heard it pronounced Baal. But they were offering their their kids up as burnt offerings to that God. So they they were doing quite a bit of wickedness, and that is why God was driving them out. So now you have a good picture of who the Canaanites were. One of the people groups of the Canaanites were the Gibeonites. And the Gibeonites were Hivites, as I said, was a Canaanite people group. And, and this is where I've got some lengthy reading to do. So just bear with me. Joshua chapter 9 tells the story of the interaction between the Gibeonites and uh, Joshua and Israel. This is... They had just conquered some kings on the east side of the Jordan. They crossed over the Jordan River into the land of Canaan, and they're prepared to go to war with the, the Canaanites in the land of Canaan. So that's where we're at at this point. Uh, and in Joshua chapter 9, it tells, uh, and I'm going to read pretty much the entire chapter, and it came to pass when all the kings who were on this side of Jordan in the hills and the lowlands and all the coasts of the great sea towards Lebanon. This is on the west side of Jordan. This side of Jordan is the west side of Jordan. Uh, we'll pull up that map real quick, show you real quick. This is the Jordan River, runs right here, connects the Galilee Sea with the Salt Sea. This is the east side. This is the west side. This is Lebanon up here, Phoenicia area. So just so you kind of have an idea of where we're at. So back to the story. So, and it came to pass when all the kings who were on this side of Jordan in the hills and in the lowlands and the coast of the great sea towards Lebanon, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, Pezrite, Pez, Perizzite, Hivite, Jebusite, heard about it. They gathered up to fight with Joshua and Israel. So these kings prepared themselves. They got together and said, we're going to fight Israel. Now, Israel was a vast, some estimates put the number of Jews at this particular time is uh, capable of going to war uh, over one million people. So it was quite a large uh, group of people that were coming into Canaan. It wasn't no small tribe. It was uh, 12 tribes, actually, or 13 tribes, if you count Levi. And uh, it was a large group of people. And these kings, uh, they, they were large groups, too. They were capable of fighting Israel. They were large enough to take on Israel. 
but not large enough to take on Israel's God. I just want to point out, we're talking about a significant amount of people here. It says, but listen to this, but when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, now if you remember Jericho, they uh, marched around the city and then blew their uh, seven times and then seven times on the last day and blew their horns, the walls fell in and and they took the city. They, they heard about what happened. Ai is another king that they had defeated. So when Gibeon had heard all this, they worked craftily, in other words, deceitfully, and went and pretended to be ambassadors. And they took old sacks on their donkeys and wineskins torn and mended, and old and patched sandals on their feet, and old garments on themselves, and all the bread or the provision was dry and moldy. And they went to Joshua at the camp of Gilgal and said to him and to the men of Israel, We have come from a far country, now therefore make a covenant with us. In other words, they were holding themselves out to Israel as, hey, we're not these people that are near to you, these Canaanites. We're from someplace else, further away. So make a covenant with us. And when the men of Israel said to the Hivites, because that's what they were, Hivites, ultimately Canaanites, perhaps you dwell among us. How can we make a covenant with you? They're like, they're, they're thinking there's probably something going on here. Uh, they're probably part of the Canaanites. But they said to Joshua, we are your servants. And Joshua said to them, Who are you, and where do you come from? And they said to him, From a far country your servants have come, because of the name of the Lord your God, for we have heard of his fame and all that he did in Egypt. So notice here that they heard of the God of Israel and all that he did in Egypt. And this was some 40 years ago. The stories are still going on. 40 years it has been since uh, Moses took the children of Israel out of Egypt. And they heard them stories and they're believing those stories. And all he did to the two kings of the Amorites that were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon, the king of Heshbon, and Og, the king of Basha, who was at Astaroth. Therefore our elders and all the inhabitants of our country spoke to us, saying, Take provisions with you for the journey, and you shall go meet them and say to them, We are your servants now. We are your servants now, therefore, make a covenant with us. This bread of ours we took hot for our provision from the houses on the day we departed to come to you. But now look, it is dry and moldy. And these wineskins which we fill with new wine, and see, they are torn. And these are garments and our sandals have become old because of a very long journey. Now the men of Israel took some of their provisions, and, but they did not ask counsel of the Lord. So Joshua made peace with them. And made a covenant with them to let them live, and the rulers of the congregation swore to them. I just want to point out, we had just read that God told Israel, don't make a covenant with any of the Canaanites. Now these Gibeonites, they're Canaanites. They just made a covenant with them, and this is important. That's, I guess... The single most important thing to grasp right now is that Israel made a covenant with some Canaanites when God told them not to. So I want you to keep bear that in mind for the rest of this story. And it happened at the end of three days after they had made the covenant with them that they heard that they were neighbors who dwelt near them. Then the children of Israel, they found out the deception. The children of Israel came to their cities on the third day. Now their cities were Gibeon, uh, Chipera, uh, Beeroth, at Kirjath, at Jerem. Now, I don't know if I'm pronouncing any of that right, but I'm giving it a good old tip. But the children of Israel did not attack them because the rulers of the congregation had sworn to them by the Lord God of Israel. And all the congregation complained against the rulers. Then the rulers said to the congregation, We have sworn to them by the Lord God of Israel. Now therefore we may not touch them. This is what we will do to them. We will let them live, lest the, lest wrath be upon us because of the oath which we swore before them. So the first thing they said is, look, we have to let them live. We made an oath before God. We don't want God's wrath on us for violating that oath. And the rulers said to them, let them live, but let them, listen to this, note this, let them be woodcutters and carriers for all the congregation as the rulers have promised them. So they're going to basically enslave them. 
And Joshua called for them, and he spoke to them, saying, Why have you deceived us? We are very far from you, saying, We are very far from you uh, when you dwell near us. And listen to what the Gibeonite, uh, no, Joshua. And Joshua called for them and spoke to them, saying, Why have you deceived us, saying, We are very far from you when you dwell near us? And now, therefore, you are cursed, and none of you shall be freed from being slaves. Woodcutters and water carriers, listen, for where? The house of my God. So they're woodcutters and water carriers for this tabernacle that Moses had them built, built in the wilderness after a pattern that God uh, gave him, gave him the instructions on how to build it. So now they're woodcutters and water carriers for this particular house. Now I just want to make one note about the woodcutter part. Why woodcutters? Because the tabernacle was used to offer burnt offerings. The Jewish people were probably some of the best butchers ever to live on the face of this earth because they would have to slaughter cattle and sheep and goats and all sorts of uh, livestock would be slaughtered and offered upon the altar uh, of God for burnt offerings. So they needed woodcutters. And water carriers, I guess they need to drink water, you know, so water carriers too. But woodcutters, that was a significant job because of the amount of sacrifices that uh, you'll, if you read the Old Testament, you'll see the priests had to do. So they answered Joshua, and this is what they said. Basically, they said they believe God. <laughs> uh, so they answered Joshua and said, Because your servants were clearly told that the Lord your God commanded his servant Moses to give you all this land and to destroy all the inhabitants of the land before you. Therefore, we are very much afraid for our lives because of you and have done this thing. And now, here we are in your hands. Do with us as it seems good and right to do to us. Now, in Hebrews eleven six, it says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And notice something here in the old, Hebrews New Testament. Here in the Old Testament, the Gibeonites had faith in the God of Israel that they believed he got he was God, you know, that he is the true God, and they literally threw themselves through deception, nevertheless, but they threw themselves on the mercy of the uh, God of the Israelites and on the mercy of Israel. And they came, I want to point out some reasons why they came. They came because of the name of the Lord God of Israel. Uh, they heard of his fame, all that he did in Egypt. They knew how God delivered the kings on the other side of Jordan over to the hands of Israel to be destroyed. Uh, they had a meeting, uh, and they said, look, we will be their servants. We don't want to die. We will be their servants. So this is what the Gibeonites basically said. We believe in your God. Do with us as you please. But spare our lives and we will serve you. And that was exactly what Joshua and the elders did. And it says right here, So they did to them and delivered them out of the hands of the children of Israel, so they did not kill them. And that day Joshua made them woodcutters and water carriers for the congregation and for the altar of the Lord in the place where he would choose, even to this day. So the, Josh, the Canaanites, these Canaanites, number one were, uh, excuse me, these Gibeonites were number one Canaanites. Number two, people that Israel was told not to make a covenant with or they would end up being a snare to them. Uh, number three, these Gibeonites believed everything they heard about the God of Israel. Uh, number four, and they threw themselves on the mercy of Israel and the God of, uh, God of Israel. So just keep all that in mind. These can that's what these Canaanites did. And they were spared the wrath of God because they believed what they heard about the God of Israel. Uh, and, and these Gibeonites are not the only Canaanites to have done this. Uh, Rahab the harlot was, remember I mentioned Jericho earlier. Uh, when the spies went to scout out Jericho, Rahab the harlot, they started looking for him. And Rahab the harlot, she hid him in her, in her house under some... Uh, I believe it was stalks of wheat or something to that effect, and lied to the 
the people in Jericho that were looking for him and hit him and delivered him safely back to their people. Because she said she believed God. She believed the God of Israel. And because of that, she was spared. Her family was spared the wrath of Israel, the wrath of God. And not only that, in the book of Hebrews, Rahab the harlot makes, the, makes what we call the hall of faith in the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31. So, just just remember, here's some things I want to reiterate. In Exodus 34, 12 says, Take heed to yourself, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where you are going, lest it be a snare in your midst. And in Exodus 23, 33, it says, They shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. So, right now, just right off the top, Israel broke this command broke these two commands just right off the or broke this command of making a covenant and they have to look forward two things one that they would be a snare and number two that they would sin against god because of these giving eyes so what i what i did because i seen what when i started really thinking about this story i seen that hey these gibeonites threw themselves on the mercy of god God's law and everything in place, but these Gibeonites threw themselves on the mercy of God's law. So what happened? So I went to follow, uh, trace out the Gibeonites through the Old Testament to see what, see what became of them, to see if they actually became a snare to Israel. And what I found was pretty interesting. What I found was God blessed them because they believed in the God of the Israelites. They were willing to serve in God and his chosen people. In the New Testament, it says that faith in God Jesus releases, the, releases a person or people from the curse of the law. That's in Galatians 3.13. But this was also true in the Old Testament. Faith in God released from the curse of the law. It released the Gibeonites from the curse of the law. They were not destroyed because of their faith in the God of Israel. Not only that, the curses of the law never came back to bite Israel over the Gibeonites. They never ended up being a snare to them uh, at all. Not only that, it's just, I'm just going to sh kind of show you what I found. Very When the Gibeonites made this covenant, Joshua made this covenant, well, the very next thing that happened is the other Canaanites heard about it. And they said, ah, <laughs> no, these guys are are turncoats. So the kings, the rest of the Canaanite kings, Amorite kings, got together and said, we're going to go destroy Gibeon. Now Gibeon was a, their capital city of the Gibeonites. They had a few cities, but it was their capital city. And in Joshua 10.2, it, uh, it describes the city of Gibeon. They weren't small. It says that they greatly, now the inhabitants, Tim one now the inhabitants of Gibeon made peace with Israel and were among them, and they were greatly feared because Gibeon was a great city, like one of the royal cities, because it was greater than Ai, and all of its men were mighty. So Gibeon, the city of Gibeon, was pretty big, pretty substantial, but it was one that hey the Canaanites are going to go destroy, and it says right here. Therefore, Adon Zedek, king of Jerusalem, set to uh, Hosham. King of Hebron, Fire, King of Jeremoth. Now remember, Jerusalem is not, not the Jerusalem of Israel at this point in time. It's a Canaanite city. Uh, Jepha, King of Lashes, Deborah, King of Eglon, saying, Come up with me, help me that we may attack Gibeon, for it has made peace with Joshua, the children of Israel. So it says, All five of these kings get ready to go attack. So Gibeon reminds Joshua of the covenant, and Joshua ends up taking the, the armies of Israel, going and fighting these kings. And then, let me see, what is Joshua 10.10? 10, I believe it is. It's a result. It says, so the Lord routed them before Israel, killed them with a great slaughter at Gibeon, chased them along the road that goes to Bethlehem, struck them down as far as Azekah and Mechada. So, Israel... 
these Canaanites are going to destroy the Gibeonites, and the God of Israel ends up using Israel to destroy these Canaanites that were out to destroy the Gibeonites, and the Gibeonites are spared once again. So the immediate effect was, hey, they were given the same protections that Israel had from Israel's God with this covenant. Now, just a just a little. This is just a little side note. Something I found while I was doing this uh, research. This is uh, the Bible puts the location of Gibeon in the territories of the Israeli tribe of Benjamin, which would have been. Let's find that map again. Uh, let me see. Benjamin is what color is Benjamin? Benjamin is this color right here. So Gibeon would have been right in this area right here. Not far from Jerusalem. Jerusalem's around here somewhere. I can't see it right off top there. But the Gibeon's right in that general area. The city of Gibeon has been excavated by University of Pennsylvania archaeologist James Pritchard from 1956 to 1962. So the city has been found and has been confirmed to have existed. That's just a little side note there. Let's go back here. Now, after the many wars that Israel had coming into the Promised Land, and, and they took the territories that God wanted them to take, and it was time to divide the land up, he had to, uh, Joshua had to find city for the Le uh, cities for the Levites to live in because the Levites were not given land like the rest of the tribes. The Levites were given cities within the various tribes other tribes it's just the way god set things up so the levites weren't going to have a possession in the world god was going to be their possession so they didn't get a portion of land but but they were given cities inside the lands of the various tribes and so aaron and his descendants who were the not all levites were priests only the descendants of aaron's were chosen to be priests they chose to dwell in the city of gibeon so that's one thing that had happened. We find in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 21 that there was a famine over Israel. And that famine was there because King Saul, prior to King David, King Saul and his zeal tried to destroy all the Gibeonites. Tried to say, hey, these people aren't of children of Israel. We're going to try to destroy them. The story of that happening is not actually in the Bible. It's just but the repercussions of what happened is in the Bible. And because of that, God brought a famine because Israel had violated the covenant that was made with the Gibeonites. So King David uh, gets with the Gibeonites and asks what did they want to, uh, to, to make this right. And they asked for Saul's sons, and they hung his sons, and then, and then the famine ceased to exist. They were satisfied. They didn't want the blood of Jews they just wanted the household of Saul for revenge. And this kind of shows you how, if you look at Israel, which is a very good way to look at Israel in the Old Testament, as, as the church, as how God deals with the church, uh, our actions don't affect just ourselves a lot of times. It can affect the entire body of, body of Christ, and that's what had happened. Another thing that happened... Uh, Gibeon, the land of Gibeon, was where the tabernacle that Moses had built in the wilderness, they located that in the land of Gibeon. Uh, there the altar to burn sacrifices was on. You'll find that in uh, First Chronicles and First Kings as well. Solomon, when he was uh, made king of Israel, he went to Gibeon to sacrifice 1,000 burnt offerings on the altar there in Gibeon. Uh, in Nehemiah, we find that the Gibeonites helped Nehemiah. This is back when Israel uh, was coming back out of captivity from Babylon to rebuild Jerusalem. The Gibeonites helped them. You'll find that in Nehemiah chapter 3. And they were also called, there's a people called the Netan. Uh, this is in chapter 3. They were temple assistants. And in rabbinic Judaism, it says the descendants of the Gibeonites. Uh, became the Netan or temple assistants that are mentioned in Nehemiah uh, chapter 3. The sum this up is these Canaanites threw themselves on the mercy of God, ended up uh, 
being slaves to the house of God, their descendants end up becoming the temple assistants. And in Psalms 84, 10, it says, For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. And I can say this, the mercy of the Lord endures forever. Give glory to his name. The Gibeonites threw himself on the mercy of God. That covenant never caused a snare to Israel. God's goodness is shown in this story on how he took care of the Gibeonites. It just it, it boggles my mind. I don't know if I made this clear or plain, or, but it is my hope that I was able to show some of the goodness of God with this story. God be praised. In Jesus' name, amen.